much and thank you for the invitation. So I'm talking about that subject and uh, first of all, in the last talk we have already seen a relationship between some distributional symmetry and the classical notion of independence as uh, Christophe Sabo recalled that exchangeability uh, thanks to definity theorems is related to the notion of independence and here this is mixture of independent uh, processes. And so the story is a bit different in this context but this is the same mechanism. We are talking about random matrices and thanks to kind of symmetries of that model we will see some notion of independence. But in this context this is something a bit different than uh, classical probability. The non-commutative notion of independence um, belong to a framework of uh, non-commutative probability that I'm going to introduce and probably most of my talk will be devoted to, to uh, recall what is a non-commutative notion of probability. So first I'm going to give uh, an introduction about random matrices where I will give uh, the motivations. Okay, so I consider um, a random matrix Xn and as usual we are interested in the spectrum in the, of this matrix and we encode it into the empirical eigenvalue distribution and I denote this measure Lxn which is a probability measure with a weight 1 over n on each eigenvalue. And the purpose is um, to some extent to compute the limiting distribution, the limit of this probability distribution. And the main example is a Wigner theorem. So if I take a Wigner matrix, Xn, which is say a real symmetric matrix, whose entries are normalized by square root of n, such that so the xaj are iid out of uh, the symmetry. They are centered with variance 1. and have moments of any order, say the distribution is independent of uh, n, then the empirical distribution of xn converts as n goes to infinity, almost surely on the expectation, to the semicircular distribution with radius 2. Okay, so this is very the, the very basis of uh, random matrix theory. And the context uh, in this talk is not to compute the limiting distribution of uh, one matrix given by one model, but to understand what is the distribution, the empirical eigenvalue distribution of a matrix, which is made of several independent matrices. X x l n so this is one example where the x l n are independent matrices say there are independent Wigner matrices for instance and p for instance is a fixed non-commutative polynomial And if we have some assumption of symmetry about these matrices, we will be able to develop a theory which tells us that the limiting distribution of Hn exists and we can compute it with some rules. Okay, and the idea of free probability so when we see one matrix, 
what is interesting for us is that measure. And we see that random matrix not as a collection of a lot of random variables, but as a single variable, which is distributed according to that measure, but we think about it as a non-commutative random variable. To see a matrix, a random matrix, as a non-commutative random variable, so an abstract, random variable. And a simple example is when you are considering uh, the polynomial which is just the sum of matrices, say we have Hn, which is the sum of two matrices, which are independent matrices. So in the context of classical probability, if you have the sum of two independent random variables, variables, the distribution is called the convolution of the distribution of x1 and the distribution of x2. In the limit when n is large, we will have a notion of convergence in non-commutative distribution which allows us to introduce an abstract object, H, that uh, belongs to an algebra and can be written as a sum of two non-commutative random variables. And under some uh, assumptions, specifically uh, uh, distributional symmetry, we'll get an associated notion of independence, which is not the classical notion of independence, and is called free independence. And in that context, the distribution of the sum will be called the free convolution of the distribution of x1 and the distribution of x2. And free convolution is uh, something that I'm going to define. It's just the distribution of the sum of two free independent variables. In the classical setting, uh, which is introduced uh, by Voiculescu, the uh, associated notion of distributional symmetry is a unitarily the unitary invariance, like for the GUE. So it is a quite strong uh, notion of invariance. And um, if time allow, what uh, I will develop is the theory when we reduce this symmetry to the invariance by conjugation by permutation matrices. Permutation matrices is a notion of uh, invariance which is much weaker and which is uh, very uh, um, useful in the context of random graphs. So in another story, not of that talk today, uh, I could uh, develop the application of this uh, theory to the computation of the spectrum of random graphs. So, but today I will just uh, mention the, the very general theory. So let me now introduce the notion of non-commutative probability. where we will focus on the potential application for random matrices. <coughs> so, what is a non-commutative probability space? Okay, non-commutative, I just use this shortcut, NC. A non-commutative probability space is something which is much easier than the probability space of classical probability. It's just a pair, A phi, where A is a space which is a unital star algebra. So it's a non-commutative algebra. It has a unit in the classical sense. And by star algebra, I mean that it is handled with an antilinear involution, star, which satisfies that AB star is B star A star as the conjugate transpose of matrices. And phi plays the role of the expectation, is a linear form on A. So if it plays the uh, role of the expectation, 
we assume that phi of the unit of A, like the expectation of the function constant to 1, is 1. And as we will need the flavor of analysis, we'll assume that the expectation of uh, a positive element is positive, and it is non in its non-commutative uh, context, a positive element is an element of the form A star A. <coughs> this will allow us to get a flavor of analysis when the distribution and the real line will realize the non-commutative distribution of uh, variables. Sorry? Yes? It is complex value in general. Mm, phi from A to C. It's a linear form. Okay, so let me give the example of uh, this kind of spaces. And the first example is to relate that example with classical spaces. If you have omega fp, a classical probability space, you can create a non-commutative space of random variables. You take A phi, which is an algebra, say, of uh, bounded random variables defined on omega, together with the expectation. Okay? It's just this data that we keep in mind in this uh, algebraic context. What we want to do is to compute the eigenvalues of uh, random matrices. So the next example, <coughs> okay, I put the index n to denote the size of the matrices. You take an algebra of random matrices. together with whenever n the trace. Or you can take also, possibly, the expectation of whenever n the trace. And so we will see, uh, just in a few minutes, that will tell us that the notion of distribution in this context is encoded in the spectrum of matrices, for at least for um, Hermitian matrices. And a more abstract context, which is actually uh, n one of the, mod the very general examples, A, B, and A of phi, you take B of H, the set of bounded operators in some Hilbert space, together with uh, okay, phi, where phi of A is the scalar product of a vector xi uh, against A applied to xi, where xi is a unit vector. So it is much more abstract context, but at the top level, this is uh, somewhere we can uh, realize most of this uh, non-commutative probability space in that context. As in classical probability, what is important is not really the, the way we define the variables, but the notion of distribution. So what is the distribution of non-commutative random variables? The distribution, so the non-commutative distribution, of a family of elements of A. So I will denote families by this bold symbol. So it is a a family of guys, say indexed by J, and it belongs to A to the J. So it is encoded in the linear map. I did not phi like for the expectation, but with the index A. So this is a linear map which takes a non commutative polynomial, commutative polynomial in the variables aj and the aj star, and associates phi of p in a. The idea is that, as we are in an algebra, what we can uh, extract from a, the numbers we can extract from a, they are obtained as follow. We first uh, do the most general operation we can do in this algebra, 
they are non-commutative polynomials. And then we capture the trace, the, the expectation. Okay? So let's go back to these examples, to at least the two first examples. Compared to the classical setting, so the notion is not really the notion of distribution in the classical sense, but it is very related. If, uh, say, A is a family of uh, classical random variables, then phi of uh, index A, which is defined in that uh, formula and in this context, it just encodes the joint moments of A. So under some assumptions, say when the random variables are bounded, this actually characterizes the distribution. But of course, it is in a much more algebraic way as we are in a more general context. For a random matrix, we can relate this notion of non-commutative distribution with the notion of the eigenvalue distribution. If AN is, say, an Hermitian matrix, phi of uh, phi n of uh, the polynomial xk by definition so let's take with we let's say we take the first definition is 1 over n the trace of the polynomial to the power k applied to the matrix an and so this is nothing else that the empirical eigenvalue distribution of a n apply to the function which is uh, power k. Okay? So for a single matrix, the non-commutative distribution and the eigenvalue distribution are exactly the same thing. Yet the situation is more complicated if we have several matrices. If you have several matrices and take the trace of a polynomial in these matrices, this does not depend only on the eigenvalues of the matrices. It also depends, in general, in the eigenvectors. If the matrices are not, uh, you cannot di diagonalize them in the same basis. And this is exactly uh, the role of the eigenvalue, uh, eigenvectors, which will give us several notions of independence. Let just me mention that, so if you have a n a family of random matrices. And we are considering Hn, which is a function of these matrices, say a po non-commutative polynomial. And say that this is the guy we want to study. And this is a guy that you know. You know the distribution of that guy. Then the empirical eigenvalue distribution of Hn is encoded is a non in the non-commutative distribution of the An. Since if I want to understand, to understand the say the case moment and the, of the empirical eigenvalue of Hn, so by definition, so let's say that uh, it is Hermitian, or real symmetric. So this is 1 over n, the trace of q of a n to the power k. And this is the non-commutative distribution of the family of matrices a n applied to the polynomial q to the k. And so the strategy, if you want to study that guy, is to develop a theory to understand the limiting non-commutative distribution of several matrices. OK. So now I can introduce the notions 
of independence and spatial prove that they are exactly three notions. Three notions of natural independence. I'm not defining what is a natural notion of independence, but heuristically, this is a rule. We are knowing the distribution of A1, A2 to AL. It gives you a joint distribution for that guy. And it is natural if you can deduce it in the same uh, intuitive way as the notion of independence, which uh, characterizes uh, the thing in the natural way. I had it arrive. Sorry. So I'm going to define this notion, these three notion of independence. And when we define independence for classical random variables, we first define the independence of sigma algebras. Here we define what are independent algebras. So I take A1, AL, subalgebras <coughs> of a non-commutative probability space like this. And I'm going to define a rule which defines a distribution on the algebra spanned by all these elements, just knowing the distribution in A1, the distribution of A2, and so on. So first, they are tensor independent and tensor is the classical construction in classical probability of independence. So this is the same rule. If the expectation of a product is the product of the expectation for all A1, so for all N, for all A1, uh, AI in ALI. So I want to compute the expectation of a product. Each element belongs to one of the algebra. And the formula is just is the product of the expectation. So I just organize my term depending on the algebra I belong to phi of the product such that uh, my element is in the corresponding algebra of AI. And here this is a directed product because my algebra is non-commutative, so phi of A1, A2, A3 is not the same thing as I permute the variables. So here I mean that I, I first start with the first variable, then the second variable, and so on. Right? OK. So this is actually the classical notion of independence. If the algebras commute, then you don't care about this line, and this is the formula you know. The second notion is also quite simple, and it's called Boolean independence because of the combinatorial structure here, there is a the Boolean poset. So we say that variables are Boolean independent. In the same context, we give the rule explicitly, like this. If the expectation of a product is a product of expectation, but no, we really think about non-commutative objects. And the naive definition is that one, phi of A1 times phi of A2 times phi of An. This is a naive definition, yet it is a natural notion of independence. It is an interesting one, but it is a kind of strange. In the sense that uh, we don't have the property that we expect in classical probability. For instance, if A is Boolean independent from the unit, which is a property which is usual for us, then if I compute a moment of order k of a, 
a to the k, because 1 is a unit, is just a times 1 times a times 1, and so on. Just this is the definition of a unit. There is nothing strange. But now if you apply this rule, you conclude that this is phi of a. You can cut phi there. Phi of 1 is 1. So it is phi of a to the k. The moment of order k is the mean to the power k, which means that a has a distribution of a constant variable, random variable, deterministic one. OK, so this is an odd property. We, we could have the feeling that Boolean independent is not a good property, yet it is. It is just a strange notion of uh, independence. The third notion of independence is uh, arguably the most important non-commutative notion of independence. It is the free independence. And it is also the most complicated to write. So it is not a rule which gives you a way to compute any moment directly. So I consider variables a1, a2, al as before. Oh, maybe I, I forget to mention something which is important here. When I write this, I assume that al is different from al plus 1, which means that if I have a variable there, it is not in the same algebra as its neighbors. OK, so. Hmm? Uh, L, oh, it is a Li. Thank you. So when I have a word in several variables, I can al always regroup those in the same algebra and write it like this. And here I assume the same. So it is Li such that La plus 1 is different from La. And I also assume that the elements are centered in the sense that, that their expectation is zero. Then the product a1, a2, an is also centered. So an alternated product. It is a product where the variables belong to different algebra when they are neighbors. An alternated product of centred elements is centred. And this is a definition. It's not uh, especially y y easy to use. Um, but um, just to mention, Veikulisku introduced that definition. Um, he did not discover at the beginning the relation with random matrices. He was studying the fine algebra, uh, the Feynman algebra of the free group factors. And actually, it mimics the definition of freeness of subgroups. So I'm not going to, to give that definition, but if you know what is the free, freeness in groups, this is exactly what. Uh, Wikulescu encoded in that, uh, in that uh, definition. OK, just uh, to mention, so let me convince you that this well defines the notion of independence in the sense that if you know phi on each algebra, a1 and a2 and so on, then you can compute phi on the algebra generated by all these elements. So I consider a1, a n, such that uh, we have the same thing as before. The elements are alternated. But I, I'm, not I'm not assuming that the variables are centered. So. And if I want to compute phi of a1 times phi of a2, times 5 to an. 
If I'm able to give a formula for that, I will be able to compute phi on the algebra generated by everything. And to compute that, we write, we introduce the term A1 minus its expectation times A2 minus its expectations, and so on. An minus x expectation. And if I introduce this term, I must correct this formula by expanding all these terms plus other terms. This is the guy I want to compute. And here, I can use the definition of free independence. This term is 0. And the other terms are obtained by developing these expressions in all possible ways. And so, these other terms involved phi of a product of less than n elements. So, you must iterate several times this rule and expand a lot of terms in order to be able to write uh, explicitly that thing. Okay. So, it's more difficult. But yet, uh, a lot of uh, studies have been done in this uh, notion. And we have a more um, explicit um, solution to compute that, uh, that kind of things in some situation. For instance, let A, a non-commutative random variable, which is distributed according to the semicircular distribution, which means that phi of A to the K is the case power of the semicircular distribution. Let B be free from A and let H be the sum of A and B. What is the distribution of H? How can we compute that? Then, actually, we can use the Stilges transform, denote uh, S and X, X of Z, which is phi of, so this is the usual formula, Z minus X to Z minus 1. So this is not exactly a polynomial, but trust me, you can give a sense to that formula in the non-commutative probability space. Just say, as the limit of this sum, phi of x to the n lambda to the n plus 1. Then, the Stilges transform of a plus b is equal to the Stilges transform of B applied to Z minus the Stilges transform of A plus B. And everything is in Z there. So, if you think about the classical case, the distribution of the sum of variables, you have a formula which does not depend on the distribution of one or the other variable. Here we have a formula for which we need that one variable is very specific. It is a semicircular distribution. And it is not an explicit formula for the distribution of the sum h. But it is a fixed point equation for its Stilges transform. What we are interested in is, is the sum. Still, it is a characterization. And if you have a computer, with some uh, numerical method, you can, com you can uh, draw a picture of the, or an histogram of uh, the distribution of A plus B thanks to that formula. So this is the kind of things you, we can do. And if you have never met free probability, maybe you met this kind of formula in a problem of random matrices. And free probability gives you kind of uh, a framework to, to motivate this kind of equation. OK, so let's now talk about the relation between random matrices 
and three probability. Okay, the first relation was given by Voiculescu. in the 90s, uh, whereas he introduced this context in the 80s, or so 10 years before. And so it is called the um, asymptotic free independent theorem. So, and here is the context. I consider several families of random matrices. So each of these symbols is a bold symbol. So it denotes a family of matrices. Here I have a family of matrices. And here I have another family of matrices. And I don't care about the way they are indexed, this one compared to that one. So let A1, A2, and A be independent families. So the first family, so it has a collection of matrices. Maybe they are dependent, but this one is independent from the other one, okay, and so on, right? And we assume two things. The first thing I assume is that each family converge in the non-commutative probability sense, and what I want to obtain at the end is that the L tuple of families converge also. So each family converts, so almost surely and uh, in expectation, the non-commutative distribution, which means that, I recall that, for any polynomial, 1 over n, the trace of a polynomial in a little l n converge to some value that we can denote, okay, which is dependent on l, okay. And the second assumption is a distributional symmetry. Assume that for each family. If I take the family of matrices, so let me denote the, the matrices like this. I have an index set GL, and I denote the matrices like this. I assume that this uh, collection of random variables is the same as the one we obtain by conjugating each matrix by a same unitary matrix. And this family, so this is for any U, which is a unitary matrix. Okay? I will denote this family U, A, L, N, U star in the following. Like if you have a family of uh, independent GOE, GOE, or even dependent GOE, it will satisfy this kind of property. Then, the families are asymptotically free in the sense that if now I take 1 over n the trace of a polynomial in all the families, the first one, the second one, and so on, until the lth one. This expression converts to some phi of p, and phi is determined by phi 1, phi l, and the requirement is that are, this is the free product of the variables. The matrices 
asymptotically free. So this is stated for our unitarily invariant matrices, and it remains true if one of the family consists in independent Wigner matrices. And the conclusion of that is that if you have a matrix Hn, which is the sum of two matrices, two independent matrices, and this one is a GUE matrix, then the empirical eigenvalue distribution of Hn converges as n goes to infinity toward the free convolution of the limiting distribution. And so if you have, uh, you know that that uh, random matrix or that deterministic matrix has an empirical distribution which converge on this uh, Stiges transform, you called it SB, then you can use that formula and you can use that technique to understand the spectrum of HN. Sorry. Yes? Can you repeat the assumption of this statement for all L1 to L? So where is the, <coughs> the, the, the claim? So the law of the law? So equality sign or what is the claim? So here you have a tuple of matrices. You conjugate of random matrices. Now you consider another tuple, which is on the right, where you have conjugated each matrix by U. U is an arbitrary unitary matrix. Then the claim is that you do not change the law of the family, okay. like a GUE matrix. And there is not a lot of matrices with that property, but the GUE matrix is a prototype of one. Right? OK. So we can tell a lot of things about this notion. For instance, uh, each of these notions of independence is actually related to a notion of graph construction. If you have random graphs or deterministic graphs, there are three notions of products such that the spectrum of the product is some um, construction on the graphs. And here at this level, we just have uh, the relation with free independence asymptotically free, uh, yet we, we can see that if the matrices satisfies another symmetry, you assume that the matrices are uh, diagonal matrices and that this invariance is by permutation matrices. This means that just you have matrices which are invariant when you conjugate the variables along the diagonal. Okay? And then you can compute it, it is an exercise, that the relation that you will get at the end is tensor independence. Because when you have diagonal matrices, the action of uh, the per permutation groups, which gives you the tensor independence, the classical notion. And there is no really uh, before that uh, setting, uh, a distributional symmetry uh, related to Boolean independence. And what I'm telling now, so this is the next part, is uh, what, what it was first motivated by a model of random graphs, but the result of that study is that I was able to obtain a generalization of the theorem there, where we do not assume this uh, assumption, the conjugation by any unitary matrices, but just the, unit, the invariance by conjugation by permutation matrices. So here we will be able to, if we are able to write this theorem completely, to have something which applies for much more matrices because this invariance is much weaker than the unitary invariant. The, permuta per the permutation group is just a small group inside the unitary group, right? But if the distributional symmetry is weaker, we must adapt that part, the notion of convergence, and we will need a stronger notion of convergence. It's not enough to have the convergence in non-commutative distribution. We will need more. And this is uh, what I call convergent, convergence in traffic distribution. Uh, traffic is just one word which is related to, to this word, which appears there. And the definition of that, I'm going to give you that definition. <coughs> 
It just involves the same kind of convergence, but for more functions and the polynomial. Functions which are of combinatorial nature. Okay? So if you have more information about the matrices, you are able to allow less uh, distributional symmetry than this one. And the conclusion of that will be true not just for polynomial, but also for these functions. So we will get more information at the end. And the conclusion is that not that the matrices are asymptotically free independent, but what appears in another notion of independence, if we want it's a fourth one, which actually encodes the three notion of independence. So here, to mark star. The matrices are said to be asymptotically traffic independent. So it's just a word. It's a first notion. It is not really a non-commutative notion of independence because it is defined for objects where we have a stronger notion of independence, uh, of, uh, of distribution. But the very, so what is important is not the detail of this definition, which is a bit complicated, but what is important is that traffic independence encodes the three notion of independence. And much more. We can introduce variables that are neither tensor, boolean, or free independent, but still that are traffic independent in this context. Uh, specifically, matrices of random graphs. Okay. What does encode mean? Implies? Uh, means that, uh, so I define something which is a traffic, which is something which has, uh, for which the notion of distribution is uh, richer than non commutative random variables. And then I can define three classes of traffics. And for traffics of each class, their traffic independence means tensor independence, free independence, or Boolean independence. So I can realize each notion thanks to a specific and explicit uh, class of uh, traffics. And then I can also, the, the, the feedback of this analysis, then we can also uh, introduce random matrices, which, for instance, are asymptotically Boolean independent, even if there, is, there are no theorem about the asymptotically Boolean independence in this context. The tools of traffic allow us to, to, get, to do that. OK? So in the last 10 minutes, what I'm going to do is to introduce this notion of traffic distribution for matrices. So the traffic distribution of AN as I announce is a data of a map which apply which for a given function G gives one over N the trace of G in AN. And there G is called a graph polynomial. And this is exactly what I'm going to define. What is a graph polynomial and what is the meaning of G of AN? 
And now I'm going to define first a monomial. The basic idea is that uh, when you have linear operators, the way you compose linear operators is in a linear way, of course. And for matrices, you do the product of matrices. When you have traffics, so and you have, uh, say, in this graph, I put an input and an output to mean the space at the source and the space at the, at the end, right? With traffics, we will be able to compose operators with any scheme given by a graph. And it will have a sense to have several edges which uh, operates in the same time. We will be able to have loops. We can have uh, edges in the reverse way. We can also have an edge we go nowhere, and so on. And a graph monomial, so is the data of a picture like this, which is a finite connected graph VE. Uh, the edges are directed. of in and out, which are two vertices, possibly equal. And here, so usually you have uh, A1, AL, which are uh, um, your matrices are given in advance. And here you say that you put, say, A1, you put A1 again, you put A3, and so on. And we do the same here. We want to have in mind that each edge is associated to a matrix. And so, a labeling of the edges by uh, indices of matrices. So, which is just a map from the set of edges to an index set, J, given that we have in mind a family of matrices which is indexed by the, that set, J. So this labeling tells me which matrix uh, is associated to each edge. So now, what is the definition of, uh, 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 how do we define a graph monomial applied to a family of matrices? So let me recall something very simple. It's the definition of the product of matrices because we just mimic the, the definition. So if you have the product of n matrices, the entry AJ is the sum for A2, A3, AN minus 1, from 1 to big N, the size of matrices, of the first matrix, its entry is A, A2, the second matrix, its entry is A2, A3, and so on, and the last matrix, we have the entry A, n minus 1, j. It's just the definition of the product of matrices, right? And here we have to see two processes. There is a summation. Oh, it's, uh, it's far. A summation for each vertex, which is not the input or the output. We have chosen an index between 1 and n. And we are doing to do the same. For each uh, vertex there, we choose an index, 
So that the entry aj of g of an will start with this choice. And I can encode it like this. It's a sum over the map phi from the set of vertices to the set 1n. And here we see for the first and last vertex, actually the uh, index is given there. So the phi of the input is j, phi of the output is a. Right? So we, we have done that process. And there, we have a product over the edges. For each edge, we have a matrix. And at the source and the target of this edge, we have two integers. So we do the same. It's a product over each edge. Let's call this edge VW. The matrix which is associated to E is called A gamma E. And the entry, so from the source to the target, from the right to the left, is phi of W phi of V. So here we have somehow defined another kind of algebra. So this is not the algebra in the usual sense. This is a notion uh, which uh, is related to <laughs> to operad algebra. And maybe in the two last two minutes, I can give you example of such functions. So by definition, because I compare it with a polynomial, if I take this, I, I put directly the matrix on the edge. This is just the matrix A. And if I put, uh, if I have two edges like this, A, B, from the input to the output, this is the product, the usual product of the matrices A, B. So if I have two edges, which are like this, from the input to the output, the entry A, J of this guy, what is that? So first, we have this summation, where we choose an, an index for each vertex, which is neither the input and the output. But all the vertices are either the input or the output, so there is no such a choice. And then we have a product of a i j times b i j, which means that this matrix is the entry-wise product. So the entry-wise product is not a, a polynomial, but it is a graph polynomial. And we need the trace of this uh, entry-wise product if we want to tell something in the context of the theorem I mentioned before. OK, let me give a last example, which is important in graph theory. So as I said, it is possible to, for a graph monomial to have the input and the output, which are the same uh, vertex. And so let's take this uh, simple case. I have one single edge. What is the entry aj of that guy? I have an internal vertex, k. So in this process of summation, I will have a sum from k from 1 to n. But moreover, if I want the input and the output to have respectively image j and a, and that the input and the output are equal, I will have 0 if j is not equal to a. So actually, this is a diagonal matrix. Then the complex number, which is associated, is a so we have k there and a there. And so we see that this matrix is a diagonal matrix with uh, uh, diagonal entries 
a the sum, so a is fixed, over the lines. And so I call this matrix the degree matrix because if A is a matrix of graph, the adjacency matrix, this gives us the degree of each vertex. Okay? And so we need the distribution of the degree in this context. And actually, let me just mention that this uh, convergence in traffic distribution, if you uh, consider it for adjacency matrices of graphs with bounded degree, is exactly benjamin Ishram convergence of the graph. So we you can also see this uh, traffic convergence as the generalization of benjamin Ishram convergence, but for an arbitrary matrix, matrix, not just a matrix of a graph. Thank you very much. For graphs? No, Sorry, I, I, I don't understand the question. You said that the graph uh, monomial, <coughs> graph polynomial can be used, traffic can be realized, can be realized as uh, one of all, all the three notions are independent. Ah, the free product of graphs. How can you realize it in terms of uh, the three? So, so if you have this, you have the three notion of independence in the classical way, they apply to deterministic graphs. Tensor independence is a tensor product of graphs. Free independence is the free product of graphs. And Boolean is another one. And for the notion of traffic independence, there is also a notion of products. But actually, it is uh, relevant in the context of random graphs. And it uh, generalizes the notion of the free product of graphs. When you have the free product of graphs, I don't know if you know the definition, but you have several copy, copies of your graph. But if you think about the random graphs, what you want is that the different copies are independent. And if you sample, you adapt this construction with independent copies of graphs like this, the notion of independence, which is associated with the traffic independence, not the, not the free independence. Is our question? Yes. Yeah. So I'm still a little confused about the, uh, you, you say that there are just uh, three uh, notions about yeah. independence, but then you also introduce the traffic independence. Yeah. So. Because this is a notion of independence between uh, non-commutative and variables. Yes. And here we have more structure. And this is a trick. Because it wasn't obvious that it was possible to have something else because of the theorem of spatial. Yeah. But there it's not a notion which just depends on the notion of non-commutative distribution. Uh, because you need this uh, distribution which involves these graph monomials. Mm -hmm. It's like you have a more complex object, so you are able to define something else. Mm. But if you just have the piece of information which is encoded in the non-commutative di distribution, you won't be able to do, do that. I can state it differently, but the, say the traffic free product of two variables, it depends on more than the non-commutative distribution. And this is because you have this, this additional information that such a relation can exist. So, it yes. means that the traffic, uh, traffic uh, interest contains more information. Yeah. Yes, you are, to define it, uh, it's not a relation just about uh, the trace of polynomials. It's, it can be written in a complicated way as a relation between the trace of graph operations. And even if you're interested in just in moments, to compute the moment of the sum of two traffics, which are traffic independent, in general, you need more than moments. You need to see the eigenvectors yes. somehow. For instance, if you take uh, the adjacency matrix of a herder schwinni graph with parameter 1 over p, mm -hmm. you can try to write uh, formulas to characterize the spectrum. It's difficult, but you see that you need more than the the still just transform. You need, you need more information. And this is just a, uh, a hint to see that uh, this such, such a relation exists. Uh, yes. so, yes. so to make sure the 
Benjamin Schramm convergence of matrices means that for any graph polynomial, this uh, sequence, so this traffic distribution converges pointwise. Exactly. This is a notion of convergence in traffic distribution. Take independence means that if I for some, I take two graph polynomials and form the that is a, a graph polynomial that is this kind of product of. It can, it computes something. So the, the consequence of that is that if you have two graphs, two large random graphs, which are permutation invariant, takes the sum of the adjacency matrices, it gives you a new adjacency matrix, which is the adjacency matrix of some graph. And if the matrices converge in traffic <laughs> distribution, or if the graphs converge in benjamin uh, convergence, this one converge in benjamin uh, convergence, and you can describe this graph in terms of that graph. You have an explicit construction. Are Wigner matrices asymptotically uh, traffic independent? If yes. Are Wigner matrices? Yes. yes. So exactly. they converge in traffic sensors? Yes. OK. Have you other examples? Yes, so of models of matrices. unitary invariant matrices, yes. permutation, invariant mat uh, permutation matrices and matrices of graphs that converge in Benjamin Ishram, and also um, circulant matrices, which means that they can be uh, diagonalized in the Fourier basis. So if you have a diagonal matrix and you conjugate it by the Fourier matrix, we have an expression for the traffic distribution. Also, bond matrices. Bond matrices have the same limiting distribution as Wigner matrices in the traffic sense. Uh, not in every regime, but in the, in the more general regime.